Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's message. I'm Eric, the lead pastor of South Mountain Community Church. Thank you for taking just a bit of your time to be with us today. Uh, we exist for one reason, and that's to help as many people as possible take their next step towards becoming fully devoted and fully delighted followers of Jesus Christ. And I know that for so many people, church and even religion can be messy and oh so complicated, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here you can belong before you believe. So our hope is that your first visit with us is enjoyable, meaningful, and unlike the church experiences of your past. We also think that the best way to experience delight is with others in person. So SMCC is about more than just a Sunday sermon. We have five locations for you to choose from where you can connect with people in authentic community. We want every message you hear to engage your head, your heart, and your hands for a life of full delight. So with all of that in mind, enjoy today's message. Guys, I have made a decision this week. Uh, and that decision is that I hate Utah. No. Nah. <laughs> well, relax. It's not all of Utah. I still love the mountains and all the other stuff. You people are mostly lovely. Um, but I hate having to unlearn a lot of the stuff that I've experienced when I came here. I've moved 27 times. I've lived all over the country. I've been to other places in the world. And Utah is the place I've had to unlearn the most stuff. And for example, simple things like spelling. Like there's going to be a town on the screen. That's town, y'all are laughing. It's hurricane, hurricane. There's no E. Apparently the E is silent for some other reason that I don't know. Everyone, I've asked a thousand people. No one knows why the E is silent. Or what about this town? Bruh, <laughs> if, you, if you have never heard that town pronounced out loud, I'll give you $100 if you can pronounce it correctly the first time. Because you think it's Tool or Thule. Nope, Tawilla. Tawilla is five syllables that aren't even in that word. There are letters that are apparently silent and also invisible. It's not just the spellings, there are phrases, unique Utah phrases. So now that the weather is getting warm, praise the Lord, uh, I've been looking to see if my neighbors are getting ready to any of their stuff that maybe I could buy for cheap, but I couldn't find it on the internet this week because apparently in Utah, it's called a yard sell, S-E-L-L, -L, yard sell. 49 other states want to call it a yard sale, but you do you, Utah, you guys do you. And the last thing is the names, y'all. I love you guys, but your names are ridiculous. They're made up, 100%. My name is Kyle, and the correct way to spell my name is K-Y-L-E. But in my time here in Utah, I've met a K-I-L-E, like mile with a K. I've met a, a K-I-E-L, Kyle. I've also met a K-I-E-Y-L-L-E, -E, and the seven was silent. No, I'm just <laughs> that, that one's a little made up. But you know exactly, what, you guys know people, and if you're a parent who named their kid with weird spellings, we can disciple you, we're gonna pray for you, because that is just unhelpful. These people are gonna have to say, yeah, my name is Zach with, um, yeah, but the, the T is silent, and so is the C, and um, so is the A, and the other A, and also the E. No, uh, what I'm saying is there's a lot of things in Utah that are unique. And when I moved here, I had to unlearn a lot of the things that I thought I knew. And if you're new to Utah, new to the state, welcome, welcome to Utah, where words are made up and the letters don't matter. Um, <laughs> they do matter sometimes. Um, but unlearning can be really hard because when unlearning is part of learning, learning gets really confusing. When unlearning is part of learning, it gets really confusing because you're not sure what you should take and what you should keep and what you should leave. And that's what this series, Triage, has always been about. Though we were in part three, there's two other parts before I encourage you to go back and listen to them. This series is about when you're in a spiritual emergency. When you, and what we've defined as that is your spiritual emergency when what you built your life on, you find out to be a lie. Because whether you like it or not, everything in your life stems from what you believe about God. How you raise your kids what type of community you want, um, your identity, your purpose, all flows from what you believe about God. And for many people, they find out that what they believed about God was wrong. And so this is part three. And part three is called Stop the Bleed. If you ever have a real life or death injury, when you are in a safe place with people who can help you, the best thing you can do is stop the bleed. Get a tourniquet, something to stop the bleed. Because as any medical professional will tell you, it's not the injury that will kill you first. It's the hemorrhaging. It's the bleeding out. And in a spiritual emergency, there's only one way to stop the bleed. You gotta learn how to think and not what to think. 
A lot of us come from religious and spiritual backgrounds where people told us what to believe. You must believe this, you must think this, you gotta do this, you gotta be this. And the problem comes when we start critically evaluating those things because we find out that what they told us wasn't true. They never taught us how to think about things. And so we gotta throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so if you're in a spiritual emergency, I think this series is gonna be helpful for you. I think today especially, we're gonna give you some tools that will help you start moving forward. We've talked a lot about how to stop and how to keep your breathing going, get some people around you. Today, we're gonna start going forward. And if you haven't been in a spiritual emergency, I wanna encourage you to lean in. Maybe not for you, because a lot of us know what we believe, we know what's true, we know what we believe is true. I would encourage you to lean in because someone you love will go through one. At some point, there will be someone in your life who is going through a spiritual emergency, and you could be one who helps them stop bleeding. So, what are we gonna do today? We are gonna practice what it looks like to deconstruct and rebuild, because that's what happens when you realize that your life was a lie, when you're in a spiritual emergency. You gotta deconstruct, and the problem when you deconstruct is you don't know how far to go down, right? You don't know what you should take, what you should keep. You find out that the foundation was bad, and so you don't know what else to keep, what else to build your life on. And so you start saying, well, I thought this wasn't true, but maybe, it's, maybe it is true, maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe this isn't true because this person told me this and I don't trust that person anymore. How do I know what's true? And so before you start scrolling through Instagram or answering DMs or thinking about where you wanna go for lunch, SMYI kids, um, <laughs> Sorry, my, my college kids are all down here. I love them dearly, but I gotta make fun of them a little bit. Before you lo I lose track of you guys today, I wanna give you the answer. Before I lose track of you, I wanna give you the answer to how do you stop the bleeding. And in a spiritual emergency, it's two questions. They're gonna be up on the screen. Is truth real and is reality material or is it immaterial also? Before you can rebuild your life, before you can start adding new worldviews and religions and ideas into your life, you have to answer those two questions. Because those are the basis of everything. And I, I was joking today or this week with my, my children's pastor because these questions are really philosophical. There's not a ton of you who are sitting there thinking at night like, yes, what is the nature of truth? Hmm, is truth real? I don't know, dear, what do you think? Like, that's just not happening. But I, I've... I've I've realized that God was, was working a little bit in my life to understand why those questions are so important. This week and last week, I've been meeting almost nonstop with people who are in some phase of a spiritual emergency. They are deconstructing from some worldview and figuring out where to go next. And across the board, they are all asking questions of, how do you know the Bible's true? How do you know God's real? How do you know what you believe is the right thing to believe? And underneath those questions are those questions. Is truth real and how do you know that it's not just lights out, game over when we die? How do you know there's something more? But I've noticed a problem with all those people that I've been meeting with, they're, they get distracted. They got a little bit of ADD along the way. They, they get distracted by things like, did God make dinosaurs? Does, does God speak Greek or Hebrew? Did God, is the Melchizedek priesthood still a thing or is that not, I, I don't know. Is, is Jesus blonde? No, he's not blonde, 100%. Sorry, Utah, all of your paintings are wrong. <laughs> he was not blonde hair, blue eyed. But they get distracted by all these side quests that don't matter. Because whether God speaks G Greek or Hebrew does not change what you believe about his character. Whether God created dinosaurs does not change whether you should build your life on him or not. What you need to decide is the answer to those two questions. So before you start building your life, before you start reconstructing, we're gonna answer them. I am not gonna let you wander out of this room thinking, is truth real? Because I don't trust you, 100%. I, see, I know y'all, I've seen you drive. I don't trust your judgment. <laughs> Jud yeah, I know, um, you, don't worry, there's gonna be a lot of other things you don't like either way. Um, but before I let you guys go today, let's answer those questions together right now. Is truth real? The answer is yes. And you know this because the answer, no, no, there is no truth, is actually self-defeating. Does that make sense? I, if I say, there, I believe that there is no truth, 
what I actually said was, it is true that there is no truth. But how can it be true if there is no truth? But if there, you see what I'm saying? It's like having a round square. It just doesn't make sense. So is truth real? Yes, 100%. And you and I build our lives like we know truth is real. Whether you've ever asked that question out loud or not, because you've decided some things are true. Some things are believable, and you know that. Things like assaulting a child. We all know that it is wrong to assault a child. Something in us knows that to be true. It's written on our hearts, which means that there is some objective truth that's written on our hearts as well. And I believe that to be Jesus. I believe it to be God. And we're gonna show that a little bit. The second question, is reality material or immaterial also? A lot of people, it's a really common philosophy to say, no, this is all we get. You get one go around, then it's game over, lights out. That is a dumb worldview um, because there are lots of things that are immaterial. Does that make sense? Truth is an immaterial concept. There is no truth box sitting somewhere. That is a concept we have. Mathematics, the laws of physics, immaterial, gravity, the very thing keeping you in your chair besides my very compelling words is gravity, and it's immaterial. It's very real, but it's very immaterial. So those two questions, is truth real? Yes. Is reality, is this all there is? Or is there something else? Yeah, I think reality is both material and immaterial. So those are the two questions. Let's jump to the Bible. We're gonna, go to, we're gonna look at a few verses that tell the story of a man who went through his own spiritual emergency. His name was Thomas. If you've never been through the Bible, if you've been around churches for a while, you might hear this nickname called Doubting Thomas, which if I gotta say, like that's pretty prejudiced. Like that's, I mean, this dude made one doubt and we call him that for centuries. I don't wanna know what we would call you guys for your mistakes, okay? I'm just saying, Peter, he went out on the water and he doubted Jesus. We don't call him the drowning disciple. And yes, I'm just, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little pent up, broken up about this. You know, I think Thomas just gets a bad name because he does what I do and he does what you do. And that's doubt. And so the first time we meet Thomas, it's in a really hard situation. He's following Jesus around Israel as one of the 12 disciples and one of Jesus' friends, Lazarus, has died. The problem that Jesus is facing is that where Lazarus died was in Judea. And a few weeks earlier, people from Judea had tried to kill Jesus. And so Jesus has this conundrum. Do I go grieve with my friend's family and risk being killed? Or do I avoid being killed but abandon my family, my friend's family? And so that's where we pick up the story. It's gonna be in John 11. Jesus, so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Like Thomas starts off pretty strong. That's A plus faith if there ever was one. Jesus is like, we might die. And Thomas is like, we might also die with you. That's that's pretty strong belief to lay your life on the line for it. And the problem that we see is Thomas has this foundation of faith, but it slowly, you can see it start chipping away. And by the end of it, you notice that, oh, that's why we call him Doubting Thomas. And so the next time we see Thomas, Jesus has done the thing. He has raised Lazarus from the dead. The disciples in Jesus have gone to Jerusalem where Jesus, he's about to be killed. He's about to be crucified. And so Jesus has one last meal with his disciples where he says this in John 13. My children, I will only be with you a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my very life for you. Jesus answered, 
Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And jumps to chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, will I come back and take you to be with me that you may be also where I am? You know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's a powerful moment, and we don't have time to get into the, the nitty-gritty of the conversation, but it's pretty wild. Jesus had just said one of his disciples is going to betray him, Thomas, or, and then he starts talking about a trip he's going to go on or he's going to go away, and Peter's like, why, why can't I follow you? Where, why can't I go with you? God, I would lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, will you now? Are you sure about that, Peter? Verily, verily, I say unto you, your pants are on fire. Yeah, because he's a liar, yeah? That, gr that joke would have killed in middle school. I'm just saying, throwing it out there. <laughs> Y'all are a bad audience. That's what I'm chalking it up to. All this stuff is happening. And Thomas, Thomas gives us the evidence of a spiritual emergency because what he knew to be true about Jesus apparently might be look a little different. And Jesus is saying, where I'm going, you're not ready to come to. So Thomas is in this, this downward swing between what he knows to be true and what will be true. And we see him ask this question, how am I supposed to know? God, if you're not here to tell me, how do I know where to go? If you're not leading me, where do I go? He is in the in-between. His foundation is starting to crumble. And Jesus says, that's the right question, Thomas. Because it's not about the truth of your circumstances, but the truth of who I am. It's not, oh, how do I know that what you say is gonna be, no. It's how do I know that your words are true so that I can continue on. Our circumstances can look very, very different, but our rest in God's character is what carries us through a spiritual emergency, as we're about to see with Thomas. And Jesus says, you will know the way because you know me. The second person of the Trinity reveals the first. Jesus, the Son, reveals God, the Father. They are one. Three beings, no, three persons, one being. Make sense? No, absolutely not. It's really hard to comprehend. And that's what the disciples thought. It doesn't help, it doesn't comfort them at all. Jesus is like, they're like, God, well, Jesus, what are we gonna do? All this stuff is gonna happen. And Jesus is like, let me explain the Trinity to you. And they're like, cool, cool. Yay. It doesn't comfort. And I think that can be true of us, that we, we think that theological terms will override our feelings. That isn't always true. The theological concepts, what we know about God, does matter. But it doesn't always change what we experience. And so within 24 hours, this story takes a really sharp left turn. Jesus is arrested, convicted, and sentenced to die. He's flogged and crucified and buried. Within 24 hours, they go from, God, how do I know that you're gonna, how do I, Jesus, how do I know that you're the way, to, oh, I don't, I don't know if you were the way because you just died. I just watched you get crucified. All my hopes and dreams have been pinned to you and they're gone now. A lot of times the disciples, they get painted into this corner that like, oh, they're, they're idiots and they're dumb and they flee at the first sign of trouble. I don't think that's accurate because they had just spent three years giving up businesses, family, enduring ridicule, traveling around the country. They had spent three years dedicating their life to one man, one rabbi, one teacher, hoping that he was the truth, that he was the Messiah. And now all their hopes and dreams have gone down the drain. I don't think it's just running at the first sign of trouble. I think, I think it's a loss of hope. And so 
What happens? How does Thomas stop the bleeding? It's that he asked those two questions. In John 20, now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So Jesus did rise from the grave, was resurrected, and he peer, appeared to the other disciples, and Thomas was out getting the food. He was gone. He was somewhere else. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. I refuse. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he looked at Thomas, he says, put your fingers here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Thomas had his world turned upside down and his buddies are trying to convince him that something incredible happened. And this is where we get the name Doubting Thomas from because he doubts in the resurrected Lord. But like, to be honest, I would doubt that. If Eric Nelson died and then I was in a staff meeting a week later and Mike Bell was like, hey Kyle, did you hear Eric Nelson died? I'd be like, Mike, did you hear about the therapy center down the street? Or like, you know, maybe you should take some medication because you're clearly seeing something here. Like that's, would you be convinced? I wouldn't. I would have a lot of doubts. It would be really suspicious. But the insinuation that Thomas asks is those two questions. I don't believe Jesus' truth. I don't think the truth that I believed in is real anymore. And I think that the reality is only in the material, that it's only in the here and now, because how can Jesus be here? I watched him die. It would take something immaterial to bring him back to life. But notice what happens between Thomas having doubts and being restored. Jesus honors Thomas's ability to think. He didn't rebuke Thomas for doubting. So many times we read that passage and we see, stop doubting and believe. I don't think it was like that. Because if, the, if Jesus was rebuking him, why did he invite him to touch his hands and his side? I don't think he was rebuking his thoughts. I think it's an invitation into a relationship saying, I understand. This is really hard for you to understand. I get that. So let me give you some evidence. Let me give you some evidence to believe that my truth was real, is real, and that there's something immaterial. It's not just the here and now. And I think in the same way, Jesus invites us to use our questions, our doubts. I don't think he's asking us to put our questions on a shelf. I think he's asking us to ask those questions, to lean on him. Because if God is true, if Jesus is real, then our questions will lead to him. But then how do you think well? How do you ask the right questions? At the beginning of this message, I said there are two questions that will help you build a foundation. Now we're gonna give you something that helps you move forward to build on that foundation because you have to decide what you're gonna let into your worldview and what you're gonna keep out. What you accept as truth and what you reject as a lie. And there are gonna be three tests that you need to apply to every part of your worldview. They're gonna be up on the screen. The first is coherence. Is it coherent with other things I know to be true? The second is correspondence. Does it correspond in reality? And the last one is functional. Is it functionally adequate? So I'm gonna run through these about what they do, what they mean. I'm gonna give you some examples and then we're gonna apply them and see how Thomas used those to find out that Jesus is the only foundation worth building on. So the first one, coherence. It means it has to work with other true things. Truth cannot violate truth, okay? So if I say the Yankees are the best sports team in the world, and then I also say the, the Chicago Bulls are the best sports team in the world, you would look at me and be like, well, which is it? Both of those teams cannot be the best because best means one. I gotta pick one. And as we all know and believe, the Yankees are the best sports team in the world. Don't, 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 don't harass me on stage right now. The Yankees, focus, listen. That means that those coexist stickers that you see on the road do not pass the coherence test because Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, even New Ageism, all claim to have the truth. It's not, one, it's not many ways, it is one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. That means you gotta pick one. 
We might be able to live and go to the same grocery stores, but you gotta pick one worldview. So that's coherence, correspondence. Does this correspond to reality? So if I change my opinion and I say, no, you know what, the Red Sox are the best baseball team in the world. Well, okay, it passes the coherence test. I'm not violating other core truths, but it doesn't correspond with reality because the Yankees have more World Series wins, more rings, more Hall of Famers, and better looking fans. Hi, guys. <laughs> Does it make sense? It's got to have objective reality. There's got to be facts to back it up. It can't just be something you think to be true. Other people have to see the evidence as well. The last one, functionality. Does it actually help you live your life? A belief without action is just something you think. And thoughts don't actually help you. Belief has to be connected to an actuality in your life. So functionality, let's play it again. So if I say the Yankees are the best team to root for, best baseball team to root for if you're a New Yorker. Okay, well, it doesn't violate other core truths. Um, it's, it corresponds to reality. Statistically speaking, New Yankee fans are a little bit happier than Mets fans, sorry. And does it help me live my life? Yes, because I enjoy baseball. It gives me a team to root for. It influences how I do things because I enjoy being better than everyone else. Um, oh, yeah, I know. I'm messing with you guys. I've been messing around because... These questions can feel really heady, feel really philosophical when you're just asking, does this correspond to reality? It, does this violate other core truths? It, it can get out of hand really quickly. So you gotta bring it down to the real level because you are applying these right now to how you live. So let's jump back to Thomas. Thomas applied these three tests to decide Jesus is the truth. Jesus, being in this room with the other disciples, is strange. I just saw him die, but it is coherent because if Jesus is the Messiah, if he is God, if he is the second part of the Trinity, then absolutely he can raise, be raised from the dead. It is coherent with a worldview that says God is real and truth is found in him. So that's coherence, check one. The next is correspondence. Does it correspond to reality? The doors were locked. No one else was in that room, and yet Jesus appears. Okay, miraculous, but I can put my hands in his nail wounds. I can put my hand on his side. Other disciples are witnessing this. There are objective facts that correspond to reality. Okay, so it's strange, but if God is real, then appearing in a locked room is pretty low on the bar of things that God can do. Last one, functional. If Jesus is God, if he lived a perfect life, died for our sins, was resurrected on the third day, and commissioned the disciples to go into all Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth to make disciples, then it is functional because he is worth building on. He is worth changing our lives and altering our lives for because he is truth. Thomas applied those three questions to his new worldview and decided that Jesus is worth building his life on. So if you're in a spiritual emergency, truth is real. It's more than just the here and now. There's immaterial things that you need to address. And as you look at building your life, about adding in new worldviews, new thoughts, I don't care whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, pick a, pick a thought, pick a religion, pick a worldview. It has to pass those three tests. It has to Otherwise, you will experience another spiritual emergency. I think the reason time Thomas doubted isn't because, isn't because he didn't believe Jesus was God. I think that he was afraid because the only thing worse than being lied to once is being lied to again. And I think that as we experience spiritual emergencies, the worst thing that we could give people in that situation, whether it's ourselves or our friends, is false hope. But Jesus honored his ability to think. And so the bottom line is you can stop the bleed. You can stop the bleeding by answering life's most foundational questions and then building on them. These two questions cauterize the wound. They stitch up the gash. They keep you from deconstructing any further. Because if we don't answer these questions, what are we doing here? If you don't think truth is real, what are you doing in this room? because my truth wouldn't be better than your truth or his truth or her truth. Why? You can make up your own reality if that's the case, but I think you'll find it to be hopeless. 
And if you think that it's just the here and now, then what are you, what are you building your life for? The next moment that could be taken away from you in an instant? There are two cards that I want to point out to you. They're at the info booth, um, out that long table by the main entrance. There's two cards, a yellow one and a blue one. The yellow one is called the gospel versus religion. If you came from a religious background, you need to go pick up that card. It talks about how what Jesus did on the cross shows us how to think and informs us how to live. It doesn't tell us what to do. That is not a set of standards to live up to, but a free gift we get to live from. The other one is called the gospel versus irreligion. If you would call yourself kind of like agnostic, atheist, somewhere in that mix, you, have to have, you gotta have some hard questions to answer. How do you decide what's right? How do you know what's moral authority? How do you find your identity? And how do you know it's true? I think the gospel gives a pretty good answer. And those two, those two cards will compare that. So you can pick those up on your way out next to our free Bibles that we'd love to give you if you don't have one. I think Doubting Thomas gets a bad rap. I think he made a mistake. And maybe I'm a little bit uh, amped up about it because I make that mistake a lot too. That I doubt. And if I'm being honest, I probably, my doubts get the better of me more than I wish they would. I'm guessing that's probably true of you, that you have a lot of things you could doubt. But thankfully, Thomas' story didn't end with doubt. Early church tradition holds that Thomas went to India, where he is still revered and honored as the apostle who brought the gospel to people who had never heard it before. He changed the literal culture of a country because he built his life on those two questions. And I am continually reminded to be grateful that my story isn't done yet, that there is so much for me to do because I've built my life on those two truths. And even when I do doubt and I have questions, that there is a foundation I can come back to and it's found in Christ. And I wanna encourage you that the same is true for you. Your story is not done yet. If you have not built your life on Jesus, start there because there is a hope worth having and it ain't found it anywhere else but the way, the truth, and the life. So we're gonna bow our heads, we're gonna pray, and the band is gonna lead us in a song about what it means to build your life. Father God, thank you so much that you are not finished. That life might look different, that our circumstances can look dire, that defeat looks like death on a cross, but you declare victory, saying, I don't care what you throw, I am greater. I am the way to a better life and to a relationship with me. I am the life that you can have and have to the fullest. I am the truth you can build your life on and never, ever doubt. Thank you that you are a God who honors our thoughts and that you invite us to question because you know that our questions will lead us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message and trusting us with your time. If you'd like to connect with one of our pastors or staff, you can easily do that by visiting smccutah.org slash connect. When you fill out that quick form, they will get back to you within a few days and be able to connect with you. As well, if you'd like to know more about taking a next step at SMCC, you can easily look at what next steps we have by visiting smccutah.org slash next steps. And lastly, if you found today's message both hopeful and helpful, I would encourage you to do maybe one of two things. First, you can share this message with someone that would find it helpful. And you can also choose to partner with us financially so that more people can see messages like this. You can find more information on what that looks like by visiting smccutah.org slash give. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you at one of our locations soon.